Hi. We, we didn't, didn't see, see you there. there. I'm Justin. I'm Jalen. And I'm Alex. And, and this, this is The, the Age of Explorations. Of Hi. Much like the intro song suggests, Europeans had to sail in order to explore. But let's back up for a moment. I bet you're thinking right about now. What led European nations to claim land which was sort of already claimed by millions of natives? Well, the answer comes in a fun and alliterative form. God, glory, and gold. The first G, or OG as I like to call it, is God. This dealt with the religious motives for expansion, which can be placed in the context of the Reformation, which was still going on in Europe at the time. Countries such as Portugal and Spain were primarily Catholic, and their need to spread this theology led to a strong crusading spirit. They felt the need to convert native groups to Christianity in order to combat what they considered the heretical beliefs of heathens. The second G, which was glory, stemmed from the Europeans' desire to explore new lands. But Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, why would they think exploring is cool? Well, Alex, I'm glad you asked. You have to keep in mind that at this time, few people had ever even ventured out of their hometowns, let alone to other continents. So you can imagine that there were some pretty wild ideas about what might be in undiscovered lands. For example, in The Adventures of John Mandeville, Sir John Mandeville states that in one country, the folk be great giants of 28 foot long or 30 foot long, and they eat more gladly a man's flesh than any other flesh. The third, and arguably most influential G, was that of gold, or economic profit. Based on the accounts of people like Marco Polo, who frequently traded in the court of Kublai Khan, Europeans knew that there was cool stuff to be claimed in other parts of the world. Unfortunately for them, alternative routes had to be found for places like China and India, since the Ottomans had taken control over much of the Mongol Empire. If you recall, the Ottomans were primarily Muslim, which led them to be hostile towards the Christian cheaters from the West. This relationship between the two religious groups led to the nations off the west coast of Europe to explore using more advanced navigational systems. Now obviously, this led explorers like Prince Henry the Navigator from Portugal, so called because he was not a navigator, to adopt new technologies such as the axial rudder for their ships making them much more capable of long trips. Furthermore, the old techniques for navigation made a comeback and were revolutionized. For instance, the Portolani, which were the charts of the world as seen through the eyes of the early 13th and 14th century mathematicians, became extraordinarily useful to explorers. As well, Ptolemy's geography had laid down the basis for the new generation of sailors. New ships also had to be made, as they housed the much-needed room for goods and eventually slaves, but we will come back to that later. So let's talk about the empires. The Portuguese, with the leadership of explorers like Vasco da Gama, allowed for the development of maritime trade to India and Africa. Now, while the Portuguese focused greatly on the slave trade, they were mainly aimed towards the spice trade in southern Asia because during this time period, salt and pepper were as valuable as gold. So be grateful next time you ask your sibling to pass the shredded gold so you can go ahead and shake it onto your soup. The Portuguese would have died for that soup. Well, anyway, back to the seizure of India. So, in 1511, Albuquerque sailed to the harbor of Malacca on the Malay Peninsula in order to set up trade routes with the natives. However, these seemingly peaceful deals turned sour once he conquered the city and began cutting off the right hands of the captured men and slicing the ears off the women, just to incite fear. Generally, pretty bad stuff. But it's important to remember that Portugal was only one side of the coin. In the neighboring country of Spain, conquistadors, or conquerors in Spanish, were massively successful in the, get this, conquest of native groups. One such group was the Aztecs, who occupied the, in what we now call Mexico. Although they were the dominant group in the region, they nonetheless fell to Hernan Cortes when they said, and I quote, Cash me inside my well-defended city of Tenochtitlan. How about that? Bad move on their part. He took the Aztec leader, Montezuma, hostage and eventually took control of the city. Another famous conquistador was Francisco Pizarro, who toppled the Inca Empire in the west coast of South America. Long story short, he took advantage of a civil war brewing between the natives through a combination of superior firepower, despite being severely outnumbered. Now it's time for the open letter. But firstly, let's take a look at what we've got today. Oh, would you look at this? It's sugar and spice and everything nice. 
So, just like these various spices, many South Asian villages and ports would specialize in this trade, which clearly benefited the explorers more than the natives, who would have to go through the treacherous labor to gather these. And now, let's get into the letter. Dear Christopher Columbus, Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is where you actually come from. Now, most people are under the misconception that you are Italian, but could not gain their government support, so you fled to Spain. However, I know truly that you are an impasta. That's right. This whole time you've been trying to hide the fact that you err from the lands of Portugal, and which you once again failed to gain the support of. Anyway, throughout all of your hardships, the explorers and future generations of Europe and North America would come to recognize you as a hero for your failure to read a map. Congratulations on the mass murder of thousands of natives as well. Truly something to be proud of. Best wishes, Justin Harris. Alright, now that we've heard the conqueror side of the story, let's move on to their victims. Portuguese and Dutch colonies started popping up all over the African coast and established permanent residencies that led to <laughs> the slave trade. The slave trade didn't start in the good old AOE, but it did replace Middle Eastern and European slaves with African ones in the 16th century. The triangular trade arose in the following 200 years and connected Europe, Africa, and the Americas. European merchants traded manufactured goods to Africa where they were traded for slaves. From Africa, slaves were transported to the Atlantic coast of the Americas, which was called the Middle Passage, and was quite frankly treacherous. 90% of captives died before they docked. New ships brought back raw materials from the New World to Europe and the vicious cycle repeated itself. Now on to Asia. Southeast Asia in particular. Spain ended up claiming the Philippines, so their Pacific trade was doing pretty well. Their rivals, on the other hand, were struggling. Portuguese efforts to dominate these lands were never totally successful. They were small and poor and couldn't take over Asian lands, so they stuck with maritime trade. They were not a big enough threat to Asia, but the French, British, and Dutch sure were. The British totally dominated India in the 17th century. When the French and Dutch noticed this, they started competing with the Brits. The Dutch tried to, but decided to concentrate on the spice trade. Surprisingly, the French were persistent and successfully established and captured a fort or two before Robert Clive, a British military man, kicked them out of India. The British defended themselves as the Brits do, and the French obeyed their commands and surrendered as the French do. On to China and Japan. The Ming and Qing dynasties were in full swing and China was in a golden age. The wall was up. No, not that wall. That's more like it. But alas, Europeans started to arrive just as the great empire was decaying. The East India Company was established in 1699 and the dynasty had enough fight in it to confine them onto an island, but as it died, so did the partition. Japan welcomed the Europeans at first. They were fascinated by clocks, glasses, and tobacco, but soon they brought their first G to the island. M Christian missionaries were all over this, and th this is when the Japanese flipped their lids. First, the Christians were persecuted, and then merchants. They were soon kicked off the island. But, Miss Barrett, Miss Barrett, what about the Americas? Good question. Let's <laughs> sail on over to the Americas. Spain and Portugal had their respective empires in South America and Brazil to obtain G number three, gold. Well, silver actually, but same difference. When the precious metals ran out in their colonies, they became obsolete. The British and French rose to power in the Americas, and we'll start with the West Indies. They kept it short and sweet, literally. Sugarcane was the biggest power in Bermuda, Jamaica, and ooh, I wanna take ya. As for North America, we all know the British set up Jamestown in 1607 and thus a Disney film was made. Oh, what? Pocahontas was 11 when she got married to John Smith, a middle-aged man? Oh, more like a Grimm's fairy tale, I guess. However, the French did it a little differently. They were trappers and lived in those rustic log houses, had the whole log flume thing going on. We've all been to New France at Bush Gardens. In France, there's a thing called abandon, and what it means is, we're weak and inferior, and I will now give all my land to Britain. Thus, they did. By that, the end of the Seven Years' War, 
French land was surrendered to the British crown. So now that we've kind of cleared up some of the background information regarding the people involved in explorations of the 16th century, let's evaluate the actual impacts of that exploration. Beginning with the effects on European society, it's important to note that this idea of a new world led many to start afresh in the pursuit of new economic opportunities. For example, many young men from Spain sailed to Mexico in order to gain land and, by extension, social advancement through prestige. However, the impacts went further than individuals, extending to entire economic systems. New products such as potatoes, chocolate, corn, and tobacco were imported from the Americas, which later became key staples in the European diet. These goods, along with European goods such as horses, cattle, and wheat, were transported to and from the Americas through trade routes making up the Columbian Exchange, named after, surprise surprise, Christopher Columbus. Furthermore, Europe experienced what we now call a price revolution, which basically involved higher inflation rates across the board. Unfortunately, wages didn't increase alongside prices, so overall, quality of life actually declined for the average Joe Schmo. However, trade still flourished in areas, particularly the Netherlands, where commercial expansion led to the development of the world's first joint stock companies. These companies were owned by shareholders who received dividends based on the quality of their investments. One such joint stock company was the Dutch East India Company, which operated primarily in Southeast Asia. At the time, Amsterdam was sort of like the Wall Street of Europe. Now, the dominating economic system of the time was known as mercantilism, which mainly revolved around protectionist trade policies and the hoarding of precious metals such as gold and silver in a practice called bullionism. Essentially, the role of the government and trade in raw materials through the colonies were both heavily emphasized. Of course, there was also a political dimension to exploration as well. Rivalries between competing powers, such as, for example, Spain and Portugal, forced Pope Alexander VI to divide the New World between two spheres of influence in order to avoid conflict through the Treaty of Tordesillas. On a social level, exploration and eventual colonization further reinforced the belief that Europeans were inherently better than the natives whom they considered to be savages. But what about the natives? How did they feel? Well, Jalen, it felt like they died, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. Now, indeed, native groups such as Native Americans, Africans, and Indians all got the short end of the proverbial stick in that they got just a teensy bit exploited. Although the damage to these people is totally incalculable, we also know certain things about how societies were impacted differently. The African people were enslaved and killed at such a rapid rate that all population growth at that time was completely negated. This is just a little bit of an issue when groups of people are, for example, trying to survive or develop or other unimportant things like that. Additionally, a little known fact about the African slave trade is that often native leaders would sell their prisoners of war to European traders, which would increase tribal warfare in the region. Now, if you look to the east, we can observe a fairly minimal impact of European expansion on native people, since it was more guarded against foreign incursions, with exceptions such as India and Indonesia. Now let's look to the Americas, where there was no real impact of European expansion because of smallpox, which as the name implies is very small and could not hurt anyone. Oh, wait, what's that, Justin? Smallpox killed nearly 1.5 million people who had no immunity or previous exposure to that disease? Well, that really is something. So, you know, it turns out smallpox wasn't really that fun, and it did play a major role in the conquest of such groups as the Aztecs and the Inca. Now, another important side effect of European exploration dealt specifically with expansion of the Christian faith, which, as you smart students out there remember, was one of the motivating factors for expansion. Catholic groups such as the Jesuits spread their ideas throughout the world. They were especially successful in China, where the Jesuits drew many parallels between Christianity and native philosophies such as Confucianism in order to more easily convert the people there. Now, it's important to remember that everything we talk about when we discuss the effects of exploration is not by any means isolated. The rest of history, such as the development of imperialism and eventual independence movements, such as even our own American Revolution, all link back to early European expansion. In fact, many experts believe it was early explorations that acted as the catalyst for a lot of the socioeconomic problems plaguing many African, Southeast Asian, and South American countries even today. This shows that historical events can have a good or bad effect centuries down the line, even reaching into the modern era. Thanks for watching. Hey brother, there's an endless road to rediscover.
sister.